evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of our Archives Month talks for Archives Month in October 2021. This series of talks is supporting our Smithsonian poster exhibit called Picturing Women Inventors, which is available at the back of the room, which you cannot see online. We also have a display case containing information about women, both from our university history and from the local area history who are innovators, not usually inventors, but innovators. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Kathleen Shepard, who is the inaugural Christensen Fellow. She is an Associate Professor in the History and Political Science Department here at Missouri s &T. Her research focuses on the history of Egyptology and women in the sciences. Her work on Dr. Ida Bankson can also be read in Selective Blindness in the online magazine, Lady Science. With no further ado, Dr. Kathleen Shepard. Thank you. Um, is everybody hearing everything okay? Yep. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming this evening. Uh, before I get started, uh, I would like to thank Larry Gragg for introducing me to Dr. Ida Bankson and for letting me use a lot of his research here and in an article that I wrote for the online magazine Lady Science about this same topic, also titled Selective Blindness, as Debbie said. Dr. Gregg also wrote about Bankson in his new Forged in Gold, and if you haven't had a chance to look at a copy of this beautifully written and illustrated book, you have to prioritize that. The library has a copy, and I know the bookstore has um, copies um, for sale. Uh, Kathleen Seal at the Rolla Office of the State Historical Society of Missouri, located in the basement of the library, kindly pulled out loads of maps of Rolla for me to look at and sent me many of the images I'm going to show you this evening. So thank you. Thanks also to Debbie Griffith, the s and archivist who sent some important student statistics my way. And I also found quite a bit of information in the public domain. So newspaper archives, the Library of Congress online Sanborn fire maps, and through the census material available at Ancestry.com. I'm telling you this to start um, because Dr. DeWitt said I should. No, um, because rarely do we know where scholars get their information when they're giving a talk, right? Normally we have it in footnotes, but very rarely do we sort of say it big and out loud. I also wanted to show that most of this information about Bankson comes from primary sources pieced together from multiple places because there's virtually nothing in the historical narrative out there about her and the reasons why are a major part of this presentation. Also, just to let you know a little bit more about myself, I'm a biographer at heart. I love life stories. I think they reveal so much about history. So while this is a talk about Ida Bankson and the truly groundbreaking work she did on trachoma, I'll talk about her life as well as her work and the life of the trachoma hospital because places have biographies too. So the October 1913 issue of Popular Science Monthly was devoted to the topic of immigration and public health. In it, Healthy white American citizens read about the scourge of disease that threatened the nation, not just from the Native American population who were already segregated into reservations in the American West, but also from people coming into the country from Eastern Europe and Asia. It said, quote, certain diseases have been considered so dangerous to the individual or to the public, people read, as to be included in a list of conditions which are absolutely excluded by the immigration law. Among these are venereal and other dangerous or loathsome contagious diseases, including tuberculosis, trachoma, filariasis, also known as elephantiasis, and hookworm infection. Insanity, epilepsy, and mental defectiveness are likewise excluded, end quote. With venereal diseases and other con contagious diseases like tuberculosis, the cause of such illnesses was known, even if treatments over 100 years ago were not really that effective. The generic term insanity and other ailments considered to be some sort of mental deficiency, like epilepsy and alcoholism, were drains on public resources. Tests were done on hopeful immigrants from literacy and language fluency to eyesight and general physicals. If something arose that was questionable, it was either quarantine in an Ellis Island quarantine block or expulsion from the country. They just put you on a boat back home. Unfitness was not to be tolerated in immigrants. Hardly one to calm public xenophobia, popular science told its readers that trachoma, otherwise called Egyptian ophthalmia, is, quote, an inflammatory co communicable disease of the eyelids of unknown causation, having the most serious sequelae of deformity of the eyelids 
impairment of vision, and blindness, end quote. The fact that it was so widespread in the U.S. at the time, in fact, tens of thousands of the registered blind in the U.S. were so from trachoma, they wrote, not only caused, quote, decreasing economic efficiency, but also cost local communities an average of $10,000 per blind person to support their lives. And this at the turn of the century is like 80 to $100,000 today. So that's a lot. The disease destroyed native populations in Arizona and Alaska, according to M.H. Foster of the U.S. Public Health Service. And the disease, quote, ranked with syphilis and tuberculosis as one of the most destructive to which native populations are subject, end quote. Because the outcomes were dev devastating, blindness and the inability to work, but the causes were unknown, the Public Health Service put into place two ways to manage the disease. First, the prevention of new cases, and second, the treatment and cure of existing cases. The best way saw for the first solution to be successful was to bar anyone with trachoma from entering the US, so they did. And you can see um, this is the immigrant hospital at Ellis Island. Um, and if you go to Ellis Island, this is still there. Um, and you can sort of take a tour of uh, the facilities. I, you have to have a strong stomach for a tour of the facilities. So, um, so to be successful is to bar anyone with trachoma from entering the US, so they did. And this was easy enough to do. Public health initiatives were relatively simple at the time. A 48 hour to two week quarantine, as I said earlier, and a eugenical treatment of legal immigrants. These eugenic policies or policies that favor quote, fitness in human specimens would identify fitness of physical, mental, and social health in myriad but vague ways. The second way to beat trachoma would take some time and that's where our story really picks up. So tonight I wanna to talk about Dr. Ida Bankson. Through her barrier breaking work on trachoma, Bankson made Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy, now Missouri s &T, and RALA itself, the epicenter of the end of a debilitating epidemic of infection and blindness that had major impact not only on the Ozark community in the 20th century, but on most of the known world for centuries before that. I will tell as much of her story as we can know, given she was a woman in the sciences in the early 20th century, and talk about why she, her life, and her work were crucial to the history of public health in the United States. Ida Bankson was born in 1881 in Harvard, Nebraska. She was the middle of three Bankson daughters. Bankson's father, John, was a shoemaker and her mother, Ingrid, was a homemaker as married women were at the time. The couple arrived in the US in 1873 from Sweden before any of their daughters were born. Both of Ida's sisters ended up as school teachers and like Ida herself, neither of them got married possibly and probably because they would have had to quit working. Bankston attended the University of Nebraska and graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1903 with majors in languages and mathematics. She may have been the only one of her siblings to go to university, but that part isn't quite clear from what I could see in the census. After Bankston graduated, she began working as a cataloger for the US Geological Survey in Washington, DC, but she realized that science was where her interests and the higher salary lay. So she went to the University of Chicago, uh, where she earned her master's degree in 1913 and her PhD in 1919 in bacteriology. It wasn't unheard of for women to go to get their PhDs in the sciences at the time, but it also wasn't particularly common. She would have had to have the support of her family. And even at the largely progressive University of Chicago, a male professor would have had to be willing to accept her into his lab. While she was getting her doctoral degree, she was also working as an assistant bacteriologist for the U.S. Public Health Services Hygienic Laboratory, now known as the National Institutes of Health. And this was the building for it in Washington, D.C. Um, from 1904 to 1938. Benson was the first woman ever to work there. One of her colleagues there at the time, Philip Stigerson, recalled in 1988 of Benson, quote, the NIH was preceded by a laboratory of infectious disease in Washington, D.C., the Hygienic Laboratory. I had quite a bit of contact with two of the workers there, Dr. I Dr. Ida Bankson and the director whose name I've lost now. It was from this laboratory that the NIH developed. It was really a wonderful laboratory, but it did not have money to put out grants. It was really a consulting laboratory. Everybody could go there and learn, and it was really a very fine thing. I spent quite a bit of time there on trachoma research because Dr. Ida Bankson was interested in it, and she had a lot of influence in the early trachoma work. So already early on, she was interested in trachoma. At the hygienic lab, 
They said that she filled her position so ably that she paved the way for 10 more women to join the lab over the next 20 years. And while 10 women over 20 years is an average of about one every two years, it doesn't really sound that significant, right? But in the early 20th century, to be a woman in the sciences, you really had to overperform and outdo your male colleagues to just be seen as equal to them. It's still very much the case today, but women aren't as much of a novelty in many sciences as they were before we had the right to vote. So as a woman, Benson knew she was representing all other potential future women, and she clearly did a good job of it. Benson quickly established herself as one of the country's leading bacteriologists, so much so that in her position, she was just moved wherever the US Public Health Service needed her. For example, in 1917, she was also partly responsible for figuring out the source of a deadly tetanus outbreak in the US, which was traced back to tetanus organisms being present on the points used to prepare skin for smallpox vaccinations. Because smallpox was eradicated through vaccination efforts in the Americas by 1971, with the last routine vaccinations of the American public stopped in 1972, and endemic cases of smallpox around the world were eradicated by 1977, there are a lot of people alive today who don't know how the smallpox vaccine process works because other people did it for us. Just putting that out there. The smallpox vaccine was inoculated by scratches into the superficial layers of the skin with a wide variety of instruments used to achieve this. They used to just use needles in the early days, um, or they could be multi-pointed and multi-bladed spring operated instruments specifically designed for the purpose. But if bacteria were on the needles, this would infect the inoculated person with whatever other disease was there, like typhus. Bankson also worked with bacteriologist Alex Evans, the two of them finding that contaminated milk was spreading a bacterial infection known as undulant fever, especially in infants, which led to the rapid acceptance and spread of the pasteurization movement in the United States. Pasteurize your milk, you know, boil it so it's free from those pathogens. Bankson's work was so important that by 1921, she was in Arizona leading a team of over 400 biologists helping maimed World War I soldiers regain control of, quote, injured members and deranged mental faculties. At the same time, in relation to her work with the wounded soldiers, she was also working on toxic anaerobic bacteria, such as Clostridium botulinum, or the botulinum toxin, Botox. There were outbreaks of paralytic diseases impacting chickens as an important food source, and Bankson isolated Clostridium uh, botulinum as the cause, opening the door for understanding other paralytic diseases that made humans ill. And later on, she proved that infantile paralysis was also caused by botulism, which is one reason why you shouldn't give um, babies under the age of one honey, because it sometimes contains the botulinum toxin. Throughout all of her early work, the bottom line was that Dr. Ida Bankson was good at what she did and operated with such a level of precision and had a highly significant result that led to effective prevention and treatment of diseases that had killed millions of people throughout human history. The U.S. Public Health Service then moved her to Rolla, Missouri, the center of an outbreak of trachoma. So here we are, we're in Rolla. But what's trachoma first? Okay, what does it do? Rather than figure it out alongside Bankson, which we could do, um, we have the benefit of hindsight, so we can truly understand the significance of the disease. I won't be showing a slide for trachoma, mainly because diseases of the eye are just not fun to look at for really any period of time. So that's not what we're going to do. The World Health Organization tells us that trachoma is a bacterial infection of the eye and its surrounding area. It's caused by the bacterium Chlamydia trachomatis, and it's easily spread through direct personal contact, shared towels and cloths and flies that have come in contact with the eyes or nose of an infected person. It's as easy to transmit as pink eye is, which is highly contagious. If left untreated, repeated trachoma infections can cause severe scarring of the inside of the eyelid and can cause the eyelashes to scratch the cornea, known as trachiasis. In addition to causing itching and pain, trachiasis permanently damages the cornea and can lead to irreversible blindness. We know now that trachoma spreads in areas that lack adequate access to water and sanitation and currently affects the most marginalized communities in the world, mostly women and children in developing countries. Because trachoma is transmitted through close personal contact, it tends to occur in clusters, 
um, often infecting entire families and communities as we see in the early 20th century in the Ozarks. We now know that promotion of good hygiene practices, such as hand washing and the washing of children's faces at least once a day with water are key steps in breaking the cycle of trachoma transmission. Improvements in community and household sanitation, such as the provision of household wash basins and separate toilets, help control fly populations and breeding grounds. Increased access to water facilities, uh, water facilitates good hygiene practices and is vital to achieving sustainable elimination of the disease. Separation of animal quarters from human living space, as well as safe handling of food and drinking water, are also important environmental measures that affected communities can take within a trachoma control program. We know that now. We didn't know that then. So here we go. By the start of the First World War in 1914, the highly communicable disease of trachoma was rampant in the United States. It was hitting the Ozarks especially hard where the Surgeon General of the United States reported that over one in five people, that's 21% of people who were drawing pensions, quote, on account of blindness were blind as a result of trachoma. That's a lot of people. Because of the fact it was taking a major toll on the area, in June of 1923, a wood frame house on Elm Street in Rolla opened as only one of four trachoma hospitals in the country. The others were in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky, all of which treated a growing number of people suffering from this debilitating bacterial eye infection with seemingly no cure. As those familiar with this area might realize, first of all, four trachoma hospitals in the country, all within Ozark states touching Missouri, meant that here was the largest and the most debilitating outbreak and not, in fact, in port cities where immigrants were legally arriving in the country. Further, there were few Native American groups not on reservations or even living in these states at the time, so blaming those groups wasn't really feasible either. Also, um, in 1924, Rolla, along with the other states where trachoma hospitals were built, was still part of the Jim Crow South. And as you can see, um, this is a 1924 map, um, uh, the, the Sanborn fire, fire maps, and you can see here um, the uh, African American segregated school and the Baptist church uh, at First and Pine Streets. You could see that the segregated school had no light and its heat was only through a, a wood stove. And the Baptist church had electric light and a wood stove for heat. So um, Rala was still very much segregated um, really throughout the Second World War. Uh, so um, Segregation is a fact of daily life here in Rala at this point in time. So it's highly possible that these trachoma hospitals were meant to treat and cure white citizens of the disease and not immigrant populations, Native American groups, or African Americans in the area. Because of the heavy economic and social impact of trachoma here, the Missouri State Health Department then became highly interested in the prevention and spread of the disease pushing the state legislature to give a significant amount of money to help. Once the hospital on Elm Street uh, opened, it was virtually overrun with patients. Here we can see patients of all ages. Um, and the sign says uh, 24 counties of Missouri represented. So all ages. Um, Kathleen and I noticed that um, some of the kids just aren't wearing shoes. So right, it's, um, it affects people of kind of all, um, all classes, but mostly the rural poor. And you can see Trachoma Hospital, United States Public Health Service, uh, the Missouri State Board of Health. The Surgeon General of the United States reported that, quote, the citizens of Rala have been cordial and have given substantial cooperation in the establishment and maintenance of the hospital. Furthermore, the issue of public health and stopping the spread of a preventable disease were so important in Rala that, quote, the rent of the hospital building during the first year of its operation was paid by the Rolla Chamber of Commerce. The personal and financial costs of preventable blindness made finding the cause of trachoma and treating it a matter of national public health. The state of Missouri and the town of Rolla paid a lot of money into the investment of this public health crisis, which led to a breakthrough in figuring out the cause of, and then the treatment, and then the end of trachoma in the US. But when Bison arrived, we didn't really know what exactly caused trachoma, or more importantly, how to stop the spread. Here is the Sanborn fire map of this section of Rolla here, Elm Street, 
Um, and 13th and 12th, here's Oak. Um, and here is the U.S. Trachoma Hospital in 1924 at the corner of Elm and 13th. The old address was 1206 Elm Street. And today, as with some other historic buildings in Rolla, it's now a parking lot just off campus. In the 1949 article in the Archives of Ophthalmology, the building was described as, I'm going to put up, a. Uh, it's going to have a lot of words on it just because the quote is really long and I don't want you to get lost in, in my quoting. Forgive the wall of words here. The framed dwelling served as an outpatient clinic and hospital and also provided quarters for the medical and other personnel. Patients with active and complicated disease were admitted and were kept under observation and treatment until their condition was improved or the process arrested. Surgical patients were encouraged to remain after operation until well healed. Experience had shown that patients with trachoma prematurely discharged after operation tended to have recurrences. And I won't go into too much detail, but basically they peeled their eye, your eyelid back and scraped all the stuff off. Um, many learned of the nature of the hospital and letters and inquiries began to reach the office in regard to the type of service offered and the method of entering the hospital. Thus the permanent nucleus for the present trachoma hospital on Kings Highway, which I'll talk about later, was established. As the years passed, the reputation of the hospital spread and the people throughout the state began to associate Rala with the trachoma service. Uh, during the early 30s, the 1930s, the ophthalmologist of St. Louis in Kansas City took an active interest in the little hospital at Rolla and many visited it. These men encouraged the work that was being done and spread the word among their colleagues. Missing from that discussion, as you may have noticed, was any mention of Bankson's work. But on the contrary, Bankson was at the center of the investigation by 1924, along with the financial and in-kind support from the city of Rolla, the School of Mines stepped up and allocated space for Bankston to work in the basement of Parker Hall when she arrived, where the biology department was located. She got space at the northwest end of the lab that was there. Parker Hall was and is only about a tenth of a mile from the uh, corner of 13th and Elm Streets, making Bankston's commute back and forth between the two only about a three to five minute walk. I tested it out. It's really not that far. Bankston largely worked for the hospital, but the School of Mines also took advantage of her expertise by February of 1925, and they hired her to be a lecturer in bacteriology for the salary of $50 per month, an equivalent of, 18, of $800 today. In addition to her U.S. Public Health Service salary of $150 per month, which is the equivalent of about $2,400 today. So all in all, she was making about $3,200 per month. And I don't know how this compared to men's salaries at the School of Mines, or at the US Public Health Service, but it's safe to say that as a woman, she was not paid what a man in her position would have been. And this is based on other data, so I'm extrapolating. Even with a PhD, her extra labor, uh, even with a PhD, recognition from the executive committee at the School of Mines as an expert bacteriologist, and her extra labor as an advisor to women students on campus, which I'll talk about in a minute, she wasn't paid near what she was worth. It's important to show, it's important to know first that Bankson was not a medical doctor, so she wasn't treating patients. She was an experimentalist who tested hypotheses and passed her results on to medical doctors. Second, Bankson built her lab and cultivated assistants on her own. She wasn't working with any other bacteriologists in Rala. She was the only one. She had student assistants in the lab and volunteers from the hospital. She also had animals that she used for experimentation, guinea pigs, rabbits, a horse, and apparently a colony of small monkeys. Yeah, she had six of them. By 1930, she was boarding in a house on the corner of 11th and Main Streets, where the parking lot for Centennial Hall is now. Um, she would have had an easy walk. So her, she was boarding here at this house, and here's Parker Hall, and then here's where the hospital was. So she would have had a really easy commute. Um, so. By 1929, Bankson had been working in Rolla, both in Parker Hall and at the hospital for five years. Not much is known about the details of her work at that time, but we can piece together that she was making some headway through some news reports. Here she is in the lab. The Springfield, Massachusetts Republican reported in an article entitled, Woman Seeks Germ at Root of Trachoma, stated that, quote, the United States Trachoma Hospital and Research Laboratory in Rolla was the base of trachoma study in America and that Bankson was seeking the germ causing trachoma, that contagious granular inflammation of the eyelids, which has blinded or disabled thousands, end quote. 
At the time, the hospital was under the direction of Dr. A.S. Rumreich, and they were, quote, conducting the first epidemiological survey that embraces not only details of specific cases, but the environment, ancestry, and medical history of patients. They were bringing science and medicine together, which is new kind of in the early 20th century. The investigation covers several counties in the Ozarks country of Southern Missouri. In the following year in 1930, the Kansas City Star reported that Bankson was quote, armed with test tubes, microscope, and a small menagerie engaged at Rolla, Missouri in a single handed microbe hunt. She's been at it for five years for this microbe has escaped pursuers for 2000 years or so. She's one of a little band of federal employees who through operation of a trachoma hospital of clinics and field work, and maintenance of a research laboratory have made Rala the chief American battlefront in the war on this disease, end quote. Rala was the center of all of this, right? Um, and Bankson was no doubt an anomaly and something of a curiosity in this tiny little town. She was a single 50 year old woman scientist who was finding success in tracking down, tracing the spread of and stopping a bacteria that had plagued the area for decades. More than her work in Parker Hall, Bankson was a leader and a mentor for both women faculty and students on campus, where the ratio, as we know of it in Rolla, was much worse then than it is now. This chart here, um, based on uh, data from Debbie at the s and archives, um, I put this together to show some student demographics here. So we've got men in blue, uh, women in orange, and then, of course, the addition of all of them and the percentage of women students. It obviously goes up and down, and it looks really high right here in 1927, but that's only 6.5% of the population of campus, right? Right now we have about three to one, and I think that might be being generous. Uh, so it's been, it's been worse, but it could be better. So uh, in 1925, the Rolla Herald announced a public lecture on April 30th in Parker Hall at 7.30 p.m. And they said, quote, the lecture will consist of a summary of the applications of bacteriology, which have been effective in furthering the progress of medical science, and will include a discussion of the methods by which disease germs are discovered, and which the use may be made of these discoveries in the treatment of disease. The lecture will be illustrated by lantern slides, and there will be an exhibit of bacteriolo bacteriological apparatus and cultures. And this was Bankson's lecture, and it would not have been out of the realm of experience for for someone like her, as women were often seen as popularizers of science and responsible for the public communication of science. Bankson was then one of hundreds of women scientists who were depended on to explain difficult and complex ideas to the public. What's often pointed out in these instances is that in order to understand the science and all of its complexity and be able to easily explain it to the general interest of public can be more difficult than explaining it to fellow scientists. And as Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Bankson, who sat at the forefront of bacteriology in the late 1920s and early 1930s, understood it well. But no matter how well she did in her scientific work, people were always reminded that she was a woman. The Rolla Herald also reported in April of 1925 that, quote, Dr. Ida Bankson entertained the co-eds of MSM, most delightfully at tea on Friday afternoon at the home of Miss Marian Heller. I'd like to point out that when we hear the term co-ed, we frequently think of women. That's because the term is short for co-educational. From the time women were allowed into institutions of higher education, the term was used to signify that women were present in a co-educational environment. The educational environment was meant to mean men only because it had been that way for centuries. And co-educational was when women were there allowed to be educate, educated alongside of men. It's an antiquated term that unfortunately is still frequently used to signify women on a university or college campus. So um, a, a better term really, especially in the 21st century would be mixed, like a mixed campus. Um, but to, to use the term co-ed to only mean women uh, is, is an antiquated term. So these teas and separate women-only events were important and impactful for women students. On a campus right now that is still largely three to one, men to women, having women-only organizations is still crucial for professional support and social development. Students looked up to Bankston for guidance as a woman in the sciences. Further in 1930, the Kansas City Star reported that, quote, she finds time for some social contact in a reading club. And occasionally, 
She gets in her automobile and drives to St. Louis to see a show or attend a lecture or concert and being a woman as well as a scientist to take a look through the shops. By the time she left Rolla in 1931, over 1,500 patients had been treated at the hospital since its founding in 1923. As we now know, Bankson found that trachoma was caused by the chlamydia trachomitis bacterium, and it's shown through her work in the hospital that consistent hygiene practices like washing hands, faces, not sharing towels would stop the spread of the disease. It seemed so simple. The problem in this area was, however, the lack of access to running water and the ability to easily launder towels and wash rags in these rural areas most hard hit by the disease. At this point, too, the only treatment for the disease of the eye wash, the only treatment for the disease was eye washing and sometimes surgery to scrape away the trachiasis on the inside of the eyelid when the infection got so bad. She left Rella not because she didn't do her job, but because she did it so well. She was transferred by the U.S. Public Health Service to Bainbridge, Georgia, and the Macon, Georgia Telegraph was enthusiastic about this development, giving hope to the area. They reported in February of 1931 that, quote, plans for a trachoma clinic in Bainbridge started Monday upon the arrival of Dr. Ida Bankson, a cage of six monkeys for Dr. Bankson's research work, Miss Grace Harwood, Harwood, special nurse, and Miss Margaret Jones, also of the United States Public Health Service from government headquarters at Rolla, Missouri, end quote. So she kept her monkeys. So what happened to the trachoma hospital after Bankson left? Well, it remained on Elm Street until 1939. So here is a map of Rolla. Thanks to the State Historical Archives, you can see the golf course here. Here is Missouri School of Mines. Here's King's Highway coming through. Um, here's the train. And the detail of it, you can see that you've got the State Trachoma Hospital here at uh, 13th and Elm. And then you can see down here, site of new State Trachoma Hospital. So the Rolla Chamber of Commerce donated this land just south of the golf course um, for the new brick trachoma hospital on Kings Highway in Rolla, and the hospital officially opened in 1939. Here it is right here. The building still remains. Uh, and then here is, you can see it from uh, 66 and 63. CVS is like right here, right? There's a light, there's trees now that hide this, but it's, it's still up on this hill. So it remained there as the only hospital in the country to treat trachoma until eradication was so widespread that the United States didn't need a trachoma hospital. This was by 1957. The hospital itself had 55 beds and treatment was free to all patients. One third of the cost was paid by the federal government and two thirds of the cost was paid by the state of Missouri. The government had realized it was cheaper to pay for, for preventative treatments and surgeries than it was to pay the cost to maintain the population after blindness had taken hold. In 1936, the US Public Health Service stopped being in charge of the state trachoma hospitals. And for the next 10 years, each state was in charge of their own public health until the founding of the CDC in 1946. In 1937, there was finally developed a prophylactic treatment for trachoma, which consisted of oral sulfonamides, an early antibiotic kind of drug that predates penicillin, and it's often used in place of penicillin for those allergic to it. The hospital remained under the direction of uh, Dr. Rumreich, and by 1941, Arthur Sinistall was the director, and here he is um, in his office. This room, I've been in this room. And that bathroom, it's still there, set up very much the way it was at the time. They haven't done a whole lot over there in terms of moving the rooms around. Uh, Sinistar was a well-known ophthalmologist, not only in the area, but around the country for treating trachoma patients. In 1957, having been so successful at treating and effectively ending trachoma in the United States, the hospital put itself out of business. The building was then used as a training academy for the Missouri Highway Patrol, and then in 1964, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. It now houses the Energetic Materials Rock Characterization and Geomechanics Research Facilities at s &T. So you might recognize this. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be, this trachoma hospital faces the same fate as the other. It's slated to be torn down. I was recently taken on a tour of the building by my colleague, one of s and newest associate professors, Dr. Katherine Johnson, who has a lab in the building. 
Um, here are some of the images um, and my attention. So here's the cornerstone, it says 1939. Um, and my attention was drawn to the screened in porch. And I love screened in porches in old hospitals because it belies the fact that old hospitals and old public health treatments really relied on uh, ventilation, right? And fresh air and getting that bad disease air out and letting, you know, letting the germs sort of dissipate. Um, but this is the state of it right now. But you can kind of imagine, right? People just sort of sitting out there and, and breathing in the nice fresh air. Um, ventilation had for centuries been a public health tool to get rid of the bad disease air until the widespread use of air conditioning and antibiotics. Uh, now many buildings have sealed up their windows. So <clears throat> it's hard to get that fresh air in. Back to Bankson, though. Um, investigating Bankson's life and career demonstrates how women often perform essential foundational work in scientific research and in building scientific institutions, yet are later overlooked in the rush to attribute a cure or discovery or invention to a single person, usually a man. Like many of her women scientists contemporaries, Bankson built the foundation on which the newly funded and soon to be rebuilt Tacoma Hospital operated in Rala long after the US Public Health Service moved her elsewhere. This left the treatment and heroic public facing work to Arthur Siniscal, and he became the face of trachoma treatment. By 1937, Bankson had left Georgia and was a member of the typhus unit where the study of the rickettsii bacteria became her major assignment. <clears throat> In 1938, an H.R. Cox discovered that the yolk sac tissue of the developing chick embryo provided a suitable medium for the growth of rickettsii. And Dr. Bankson was in a position to put this discovery into immediate practical use. She entered into what some argue was the most productive period of her career, which is saying a lot. She modified the complement fixation test, which is a blood test to determine whether or not antibodies to a particular infection are present, adapting it for the detection of infections such as typhus. Her technique is now in wide use. She had also done some of the early work in the tissue culture of typhus, which was of great importance in the subsequent development of the vaccine for typhus, which played a huge part um, in the protection of troops against typhus in the Second World War. During her typhus work, she developed an effective vaccine also for the tick-borne Rocky, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. She was a member of the Society for Experimental Biology, the Society of Tropical Medicine, and a number of other scientific organizations. And she was awarded the Typhus Medal of the American Typhus Commission in 1947. She retired in 1946 after her work in the Rickettsial unit, which won her praise from its chief. This picture here is from 1948, and she died in 1952. Around the turn of the 20th century, a number of women earned doctoral degrees, then went on to do crucial, foundational, but mundane work. Bankson is just one of those women whose successes became the disciplinary scaffolding that others would build upon. She contributed to multiple urgent projects because of her drive, her expertise, and her precision. Bankson and her contemporaries laid the cornerstone of multiple fields and research lines, but few look for those cornerstones which make finding sources about them almost impossible. As you've heard throughout this talk, I had to piece a lot of information together from newspapers, images, maps, obituaries, interviews, censuses, and family trees to understand Bankson's life. Her work on trachoma demonstrates the value of not just looking for female firsts in science, but of understanding the breadth and the depth of women's contributions to multiple fields. Bankson embodies the problematic gender politics of attributing credit to only one individual, especially when those individuals have historically been men. This talk is called Selective Blindness. Part of that title alludes to the fact that history itself is blind to traditionally underrepresented practitioners and tends to highlight the great men who were given the public credit for the discoveries. That's why I think Bankson is virtually unknown. But why don't we know about Trachoma? Many of us hadn't heard of it before this evening, yet trachoma had been so prevalent throughout the world for millennia that Shakespeare talked about it in his Merchant of Venice, in which Lancelot said of old Gabo, quote, oh heavens, this is my true begotten father, who being more than sand blind is high gravel blind and knows me not. It's argued by some that the sand and gravel blind was meant to be the feeling of trachiasis on the eye, and Gabo was made so blind by the infection that he didn't even know his own son. Popular Science Monthly in 1913 had said trachoma was as bad as syphilis and tuberculosis. 
And yet only 60 years out of having virtually eradicated it from the country, we don't know that much about it. Could it be because of the populations it impacted? Largely poor rural areas were impacted or populations of color. And if you had access to hygiene and running water, you weren't really worried about it. So people simply didn't know about it. Race, class, and gender all matter as categories of analysis and remembrance in history. And we can see them all at play here. Bankston left Rolla in 1931, and it was 68 more years until we had another woman bacteriologist on campus. Microbiologist, uh, professor and associate dean for research and external relations, Melanie Moore Mile arrived at Missouri ST in 1999. On this campus, women have much more presence and visibility than we used to. And we can still see this image of Bankston out on a billboard on I-44 as you drive from Rolla to St. James. And when I saw it for the first time, I screamed. And I had to send an email to Larry Rag and say, look, look, look who's on the thing. Um, hopefully, with more stories like this, we can see more lives of women in the sciences as they should be seen for their important work. Thank you. What questions do people have? Yeah, thanks. Does this seem to, at least in the hospital setting, be primarily? white people from the area. Were you able to find if there were any physicians or clinics in the area that were treating the rest of the folks in the town? Um, I, there was, there was a, a, a Rala hospital. Um, and I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, there was one, was there a campus hospital? And then there was a like a, a Rala hospital, and then we didn't have a hospital for something like five years. So I would imagine that the campus hospital was for, you know, people on campus and their families, and then the Rala hospital was sort of for everybody else. Yeah. So but that's the, that to me is the interesting thing is because these were very specifically for trachoma because it was so devastating to the population. Um, and that's, that's really just what I love about this particular story is like, where where'd the hospitals go and what the heck is trachoma? You know, like why are we not talking about it? That's why I wanted to build it and make it a historic landmark. Agreed. It doesn't even have the sign up there anymore. It used to say um, Missouri Trachoma Hospital, but like the big stone thing, um, it's gone. Hang on, let me see if I can find it. Uh, so right here, and you can't it can't really see it, but right here is uh, it says Missouri Trachoma Hospital. That slab is still there, but it doesn't say Missouri Trachoma Hospital. It's just a flat slab now. Amanda, did you have a question? Yes, can you um, confirm the restroom situation? Was Harper Hall one of the few places on campus that had a female restroom? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Do you know? Do you know, Debbie? That's a good question. Um, I know there's only a few buildings, and I think I don't know what Harper Hall serves back then as a secretary. Yeah. Larry Gragg would know, and he is giving a talk in two weeks, three weeks. Um, so you should, and that'll be on Zoom, and you should join that and ask that question. So it would probably be most likely that it was Parker because they had the library at that time, and the library needs to be there. I just, because they put it there, that's why. In the basement. Yeah, in the basement, in the corner of the lab. But yeah, thank you, Debbie. Yeah, so for those on um, Zoom or Facebook, uh, Debbie Griffith has answered that there were probably women's restrooms, at least one, in Parker Hall. Very good. What else? We had a couple oh, yeah. from online. Oh. Uh, so you talked at the very beginning about the other name for trachoma being Egyptian. Couldn't remember the rest of it. Ophthalmia. Was that because it was first discovered in Egypt, or was it kind of like the Spanish flu situation mm -hmm. where blame gets on a certain demographics? Um, good question. So in Egypt, uh, Egypt is just at the edge of the Libyan desert, and it is in North Africa where the Sahara is. Um, so, and you get these things that are called hamsins, and they are just these giant sandstorms that just blow up out of nowhere. Um, and if you ever are unfortunate enough to get stuck in one of these, the first thing that you do is you close your eyes uh, and you just sit down. Uh, because if you try to go through it um, with your eyes open, it's going to just get dirt and sand in them, and then your eyes will get infected. Um, so it was known as Egyptian ophthalmia because um, 
because ophthalmia itself uh, impacted um, North Africa and the Middle East in such uh, uh, in such a way that that's just kind of what it became known for. So yeah, it's kind of like a um, in that area is where is where that um, illness was. So just because of the sand blowing around. So in fact, a lot of especially um, during the uh, height of the Islamic Empire, sort of in the 700s to about the 1100s, a lot of their medical research had to do with the eye and figuring out how to keep diseases of the eye from impacting the population because of all that blowing around. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Yes, yeah, Miles. Um, could you go back a couple slides to like that? Pool with no lights in that church with electric lights. Sure. Let's see. Here we go. Do you have a question about it? Uh, no, but why do they look the same? I mean, they both look like batteries. They do look like batteries. Um, I think that was the shape of the building. So here would be the front, probably the steps that they would go inside here, and probably the same for the school. Yeah, but they both look the same. They wow. do look the same. I, they, I don't know, but I think they probably built them. I mean, churches back then, you know, it was like you walked in and boom, there was the sanctuary. You had pews and that was that. Yeah, and why did they like scrape like? Because the, the inside of the eye lid was impacted. These are great questions. The inside of the eye was impacted by the, uh, by the bacteria and it would multiply on the inside of the eyelid and so they'd have to scrape all that bacteria off the inside you know how like the dentist scrapes your teeth to get that plaque off of there it's like that for your eye which is why i didn't show any pictures so like they like pull, like they literally peel all your eyelid back and like pull the wire yeah they wouldn't pull your eye out they would just pick your eyelid up and leave it on your face but then also scrape the inside. I can show you when we get home. Yeah. Good question. Hey. Yeah, so, so in searching for all your information, did you find anything on her? I, I didn't realize they're connected to Alpha. So oh, yeah. First presence of her inside the microbiome. So, so was there any um, association or either with the American Society of Microbiology to the Asian Society at all? Okay, so I, that is a great question. Um, the question is, was Ida associated with the American Society for, Microbiology. Society for Microbiology because of her work with Alice Evans? So I actually got that picture of Alice Evans off the Association for Microbiology uh, website in an article all about Alice Evans and her work on undulant fever and pasteurization. No mention of Ida Bankson whatsoever. Um, and I looked for her on there and I couldn't find anything. So no, I didn't, I didn't see that. But I will say, uh, I also am a Wikipedia editor. So I've been editing Ida's um, page as I can when I find new stuff. Um, and that, that her, associate with, her association with Alice Evans is on there, um, on that page, but it wasn't on the one that you're asking about, which I find fascinating, right? I mean, they were working really closely together and this is, this is where sort of my research in general is leading toward. And that is, I just, I just have this thing where I find somebody or I find a name and I'm like, I must know everything about this person. And I spend weeks like searching through all of these things. Um, and it's really fun, but it's sort of detrimental to just the rest of my life. And so, um, but what I'm finding, right, is that these women who, were really skilled and moved from one lab to another to another, they're not able to sort of establish like an academic pedigree that, um, that men would have if they you know, start at one institution and they stay there for 50 years, right? They train students and they sort of train up a school and then they sort of send them out and then they're known for these things. But these but women like Bankson, right? It's like, okay, you're really good at this and we need you over here now. And then, okay, great, you solved that problem. Now we need you over here. And then you solve that problem, we need you over here. So she just has sort of these fragments everywhere. Um, so she she's not like an Alice Evans, right? Or um, yeah, that kind of way. Yeah. When I was trying to find some of her writing, mm -hmm. I found very, very little. Yeah. And she has even been writing short reports for the recent one to the mortality report. 
Um, I don't know about her short reports. She had a few articles, um, and there's one obituary of hers that actually has kind of a bibliography of things that she wrote. And so most of them are, they're going to be, like you said, government reports. Um, so it, a lot of them are just labeled U.S. Public Health Service, here's the title of the thing, um, as opposed to Ida Banks and here's the title and she's going to lay claim to it. So it was more a government publication than it was a her publication, which is another thing that sort of gets, gets her sort of uh, erased a little bit from the archive is that her name just isn't on a lot of these things because it's part of the, the government health service. I notice when you do find articles written about the coal mining area, it's usually Dr. Siniscal. That's how I'm pronouncing it. I've only read his name, I haven't heard it. So <laughs> that's just what we're going to say. How we're going to say it's pronounced. Yeah, it's true. He wrote a lot about it um, in you know some journals and things, but she she didn't really. Did you have another question from August? Yes. So we have. <laughs> um, so I working here was there anybody else at one of the other hospitals that were set up around that time working on your preventative measures along with Dr. Banks? That's a really good question. Um, I She had her team on campus and at the hospital at the trachoma hospital specifically. Um, so I I am just guessing but I would say probably not mainly because the illness was so contagious they're not just gonna like let it go out into any lab um and she had all of this like specialized equipment um for it so i would say probably not but it's possible that there was some like you know somebody from the hospital like i'm interested in what you're doing so i'm gonna pop over for a day but like those things aren't um those are really fun to find but you're reading through like diaries and diaries and diaries for the one mention of this one day I went over to see Ida Banks and you're waiting for that sort of smoking gun. That's a good question. I think we have one more. I think you might have actually answered this okay. later on about do you know how many people were treated at the Rolla Hospital? Um, by 1931, 1500. And so that was in seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know the metrics on how many were treated from 24 to 57. Um, I imagine though with 55 beds in the big trachoma hospital and it was there for 20, oh, sorry, six, 17 years. I would say tens, tens of thousands, um, may, maybe between 10 and 20,000, but I am really bad at visualizing that kind of stuff. What'd you say? Oh, sorry, David, I thought you said over. No. Any more questions? This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, if you're really interested in the, the segregated school, the building is still here. It's part of a church now. The school or the church? The school is a church now. Oh, okay. And you can tell when you look at it, it's like, that's the Lincoln School. Uh, yeah, I knew it was the Lincoln. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. What are those other things? They're just other buildings, but I don't know what they are. Yeah. Good question. Why are they on there? Because that's, so this is called a, a fire 